Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Codacy. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning, where we have an exciting panel ahead. Before we get this conversation rolling, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to let everyone know. First of all, we are recording today's session. So if you happen to miss any of our discussion, if you have to leave early, um, if, you, if you'd like to rewatch, or if you'd like to even share with your team, we are going to be sending you a recording via email shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, uh, this is going to be a heavily conversational-based panel, so we want you to be part of it. There's a couple ways that you can join us. Um, the first and the easiest way is the chat tab. So for any general comments, reactions, let us know in that chat tab. Um, we'll, we'd love to hear your thoughts throughout our program today and pull those into the fold. And if you have any specific questions you would like our panel to address, feel free to send those into the Q&A tab. Of course, if you send them in the chat, we're going to get to them, but sending to the Q&A just helps us keep track, and we'd like to answer as many as we can today. Um, our most engaged attendees today, so that includes those who are most active in both the chat and the Q&A, you'll be contacted uh, pretty soon after this by Codacy for some free swag vouchers. Um, so please do join us in, in our conversation today if you want some free swag. And as always, TechStrong is giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards to four attendees today. So be sure to stick around to see if you're one of our winners. The topic of our conversation today is the future of AI-assisted development and code quality. And I'm joined today by Natalie Pistonovich, Developer Ambassador at OpenAI, Jaime George, CEO at Codacy, Bram Adams, Developer Ambassador at OpenAI, and leading our conversation today is our very own Mitch Ashley, CTO at TechStrong Group and GM of TechStrong Research. So Natalie, Bram, Jaime, Mitch, thank you all so much for joining us today on TechStrong Learning. Mitch, how would you like to get this conversation rolling? Well, I'll, I'll take it away here, Cody. Thank you so much for getting us off to a good start. And thank you to this <clears throat> wonderful panel. I have to be honest, this is like I've been so excited about this panel getting together because it's a great topic. A lot of us have, uh, you know, we, we're using development tools. We're doing, uh, you know, AI, assisted and AI assisted development, depending on what kind of tools that we're using. And we, we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about maybe where that's heading, because there's a lot of discussion about when, you know, co the co quality of code that we're creating and all of those kind of things. So we've got some the perfect people. We've got the perfect people to discuss this and kind of jump into that very topic. So. Thank you, uh, Jaime and Natalie and Bram for, Bram for being here today and joining us. I do want to say one other thing before we kind of kick into the conversation, and that's what this is. This is a conversation. This is what we call a roundtable kind of forum where it's, it's for co-equal uh, folks talking on the panel, but we're co-equal with you because you, we want you to jump in on the chat, in the public chat, share your comments, your questions, your thoughts, ideas, reactions. I didn't know that. I saw this other great thing. Go check it out. You Whatever it might be, ask us questions. You will actually be part of our conversation. So the more that you engage uh, through that chat, the better. And of course, there's also the possibility of some great swag. So <laughs> we, we love that. And uh, one other thing before we get started too, I want to thank uh, Jaime and the, and the folks at Codacy for sponsoring our conversation today. So be sure and check out uh, all their great technology and products. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about something called uh, Codacy Pioneers a little bit later, and we'll mention that too. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, you know, let's just do this by way of introduction, because uh, folks kind of learned about your title. I'm going to turn off that slide here, just so everybody knows we're in the right place. Um, would you, you know, take, you know, 30, 60 seconds and introduce yourself a little bit about what you do. Developer advocate can mean a lot of things. CEO can mean a lot of at thing, at things at different companies too. Um, John, why don't you start us out? Sounds good. Well, first of all, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm very proud to sponsor uh, this event with the great people in this panel. I'm Jaime George. I'm CEO co-founder of Codacy. Uh, it's a company that I started my co-founder around 10 years ago. Completely labor of love, focused really on helping teams and development uh, organ, software development organizations find 
and improve uh, opportunities um, for code quality. So we have you know close to a thousand customers, some of the largest names in the industry, um, and we also love open source. And so it's one of the reasons we're very excited to talk about Pioneer's program. Um, the way to think about us as a company is a DevOps intelligence platform. It's quality, security, unit test coverage in one place. Excellent. Natalie, why don't you jump in next? Definitely. Exactly three years ago, uh, Bram and I, among other, along with other four other people, became uh, developer ambassadors with OpenAI, which kind of means that the team at OpenAI spotted our activity and said, why don't you do this official? And so today this really translates to us having office hours. Anybody can book through the OpenAI website. Um, each one has a little bit of a different background based on their experience. What I'm bringing is my mix of background that I used to be a co-founder of a startup and I was an SRE engineering manager and a Go backend developer. And so this is my mix. You never know when a labor of love turns into a job. Both of them, both of you are great examples. And maybe you are too, uh, Bram. Introduce yourself. Yeah, to echo what Natalie said, um, I got into the OpenAI Developer Ambassadors program by way of kind of creative technology, actually. I was making a lot of art pieces involving AI. AI is interesting because of its probabilistic and stochastic nature. So I was really able to leverage it to make creative technology. It just turns out that the 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 breadth of creative technology is a lot uh, bigger than we give it credit for. It's not just about making things that are aesthetically pleasing. It's about making things that uh, interact and engage with users. Um, and along that process, I built this app called Stenography, which is a code explainer um, that leverages uh, uh, OpenAI's API and Kolmogorov complexity and some ad text and text trees to basically document code on save. Um, so that's probably my closest uh, bit to code assisted development. So I just wanted to plug that. <laughs> here. Fantastic. Very good. Well, let's, let's open the discussion um, you know, we're all coming to this from our, our own unique perspectives and our, both our background and kind of work that we're currently doing. It'd be great to kind of get sort of a level set on what the state of the art, state of AI in, in the development process is today. And we're talking about code assisted, uh, of course, but, but AI plays, you know, bigger roles in the whole development process. So let, let's discuss. I mean, you hear about announcements or you sign up for programs. I'd like to, you know, be part of this early beta of something that's AI in, a, in an IDE, whatever it might be. Um, what, what, Shaim, why don't you start things out for us? Kind of how do you see the landscape in the market today? So, you know, for, we have a very pri privileged perspective and position because of our, um, of our customers and the many questions. Uh, we tend to be a very curious organization. So we ask a lot of questions to our customers. And so what we're seeing is that um, from conversations that we've been having, particularly with the, with the focus on AI-assisted tooling, you know, tools like Copilot and even ChatGPT, which tends to be at least the two biggest names that we are getting from 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 our customers, the adoption seems fairly interesting. We see two groups, people that are starting to use it occasionally, but in a, in a kind of uh, more frequent manner over time. And then we have people that, you know, sometimes will oppose or not just adopt. And, and what we're also seeing from, from companies that is that most companies that we have as customers that we're talking are still deciding, you know, are still defining their policies or whether they're, they're looking to make decisions on their official stance on the AI tooling. And many times this will create an opportunity for developers to start just using um, AI tools. Uh, we're also being very positively surprised that it's being encouraged in small, medium and large organizations. And so it's here to stay and it's a huge wave, definitely one of the most exciting advents in my life as a technical uh, person. Okay, we need the open AI perspective too. I'm sure you talked to a lot of people about, should we be using this? How should we be using it? What 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 should we be doing? So, um, Bram, why don't you start us out? Sure. I guess, you know, for me, over the past couple of years, especially when Copilot was just first coming out in Alpha and Codex had just come out and people were kind of interested in seeing, you know, what were the limitations of these models in terms of writing, 
valid code. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, because of how fast compilers are in general at catching errors, I felt that even early on, the hallucination problem was really heavily, uh, maybe not, not, not as heavily taxing as it is in the space of just pure human communication of writing, because you could literally tell, okay, the code's not going to compile. Uh, so since then, I think people have kind of taken a lot of creative leaps to kind of really focus in on the UX of AI assisted development and kind of like making these tools fit into the programmer workflow while also being able to uh, take advantage of the fact that these models can generate uh, code that will be able to save people a bunch of time. And I think specifically where I've seen the most lift for people is kind of uh, getting from zero to one in terms of trying a lot of things out with their code. So it's not necessarily about the already kind of written code that you're trying to put to production from development. It's more about how can I even get started writing this? Uh, and ChatGPT and Copilot and tools at all are really good at allowing you to kind of just say, what would this even look like in code? Like give me a bride or excuse me, a wide overview of, of what I'm looking to do here. And of course, Natalie. And I'll add to that that uh, when last year uh, GPT-4 was announced in the demo, there was that uh, iconic part where uh, the, there was a sketch of some website on a piece of paper, and then it took a picture of it, and then it just wrote the code for that. And as of this week, when the announcement was made that ChatGPT can also now see, and you can also talk about images, uh, you can now actually do that. Uh, I'm posting in the chat two links. One is for this announcement and the other one is some really cool video I saw on Twitter. I don't know the person, but he's pretty much showing how he's doing that. And that's a, like even a faster way of just, uh, here's a picture, build me this. I, I know this, but I don't know that part. And that really speaks to me because I'm, I know my backend, I know my DevOps, I don't know my front end. Like if I have to build the, the facing the, the people facing part of this, I will get stuck there. And uh, having ChatGPT was already helpful, but having just here's a sketch, do everything, is one step even uh, faster, and it's it's really nice. That's an interesting use case too. Maybe, maybe you're like you're saying you're back end developer, and uh, I don't know Flask or whatever I should be using to do a a UI for this. You know, help mm -hmm. me create one, kind of guide me through the process. It, it seems like I'll throw this open to the group. You know, when something is um, impactful or people see it as impactful as generative AI, especially AI that will generate code. I mean, you can go to ChatGPT and say, write me a Python that does this. And it will provide something of whatever quality, I don't know. Um, but people kind of jump to the conclusion of, oh, well, that means we're not going to need developers. How long, you know, we don't need developers in a year or two or five from now. And then you hear kind of other people, I think a little bit more, not more, a little more sensical assessment of, well, this is actually going to accelerate and, and increase productivity of people pulling applications and code and maybe we produce 10x code, you know, in the same group of people. I, I'm, I'm curious, we've all used code assisted, you know, code completion in our IDEs and, and, and AI is there in that, in that kind of form. Um, how, how can we use AI in our development right now? You think you should be at least piloting, if not using it? today. Anybody can start. Um, I can say that while I am not employed by one company, but I'm advising to multiple different companies, I am very much using this regularly. Um, I see in the chat and I see in the Q&A that there's the point of uh, companies don't allow that IP and so on. Yeah, that's a, that's a point. I think this used to be a bit more of a problem in the past. And I think now with this being more um, compliant with all the different GDPR requirements and also the solutions like the ones that are called enterprise and so on. So they kind of handle this part. Um, I feel that this was, from what I experienced, the biggest problem in actually uh, using and adopting this. Because on the technical side of how and how much does this help, I, I did not meet one person who really said that uh, the advantages are uh, not like that, that disadvantages outnumber. Everybody has the general idea that, yeah, it can have some loops, but overall it really increases and helps the productivity in whatever level you feel comfortable doing it. Um, maybe I'll jump in. Um, I think as you started your, your, your question, Mitch, I think 
this is a great example of Givron's paradox in which more, um, as we scale more efficiency, I think we'll also scale more consumption and more software will be produced. So I think we'll have actually more work for developers um, in the very near future, which is very exciting. Um, my, I think this is a tool and this is a technology that needs to be adopted because the productivity gains are so massive that is, there's not a question of if, it's how for many companies. I think there needs to be a quick awareness also of potential risks. I think that's a must also. Things like a false sense of outsourcing. We're not outsourcing our fully intelligence and business requirements of applications. We are in control and we need to understand that. Like a refactoring uh, functionality in ID, we need to be in full control of that. Uh, training cutoffs and models also very important uh, because we cannot ask full library knowledge for a model that has changed two years ago. So it's really important that we are, again, in full control and, and really code correctness. I think humans are, are very much required in tandem to any function that we use in order for this to be successful. And if we know these things, there's a, a beautiful, bright present uh, for AI assist development. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot about like the null hypothesis for these types of technologies in terms of like, how are they actually helping today as opposed to what might be happening a few years down the line. And I can say in my own coding practice that these tools have become invaluable as IDEs and invaluable for the same kind of reason where a lot of code is just kind of getting logic down and doing that zero to one one and kind of like trying to test your code and and get to that next step and i find that that you know coding alongside chat gpt uh copilot in particular are really good at just minimizing the amount of time that i need to context switch between my browser and my ide and in addition uh having it you know type out the characters that i was going to type uh anyway uh sometimes make better suggestions that i was going to do um or was planning on doing has just proven completely invaluable for kind of getting projects out the door that are open source and kind of just actually making stuff happen because you know code is iterative it's you're never really writing the final piece of your of your code right like the idea shouldn't be that you you ship a release and you're like okay cool it has to be perfect and there's never going to be a change to this it's it's you know as their problem uh, your knowledge about your problem evolves because the world changes and your user base changes. Uh, it's really important to be able to go in there and very quickly uh, respond to that. So in terms of those proactivity and reactivity, these tools have proven invaluable for me to like create code today that I would have never been able to create before, all the way from iOS apps to full stack applications, understanding new concepts, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, it's already here, but I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of bridging the gap for other people who might be used to a more traditional form of coding and not to tangent this and I'll shut up after this. I apologize. Uh, there's a really interesting book called The Science of, in of the Art and Science of Engineering by Richard Hamming, written in the early 90s. And he talks about how he, he came up uh, working with the people at Bell Labs and a lot of people were really against Fortran, <laughs> which to us sounds like such an old technology, but to the people who were working with Fortran in the 1950s and 60s, to them, it was actually a threat to the way that they had already learned to understand computing at the machine code level. So I don't think this is exactly an analogous to that, but I have seen a lot of feedback in the community of people being um, distrustful as opposed to uh, uh, kind of like, okay, cool, let me see how I can adapt to this technology and how I can actually to improve my practice well not that it's worth much but um, i aced my fortran classes in college so i'm you know I'm a little bit older than mitch folks. you mind if i if i ask a follow-up question i would Please, love to yeah. just curiosity because like I, one of the things that i see and i use ChatGPT on a daily basis not like it's almost an hourly basis now but uh, maybe for natalie and bram is one of the things that we see at least from 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 the companies that we interact with it is 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 the zero to one is clear in terms of value, but how do we unblock the one to n? As in, I have a code base, I have to maintain things. It's, it's mm -hmm. how do we do that? How do we onboard this beautiful piece of technology in helping us maintain and scale out development? Is there like office hours that you typically do? Is that a problem that you typically see? Um, your question is how to, like, what are some good practices on scaling an existing app, like a 
step one, stage one app to multiple users, basically. Like, are you asking about ML ops? I am asking for like, you have, I'm not trying to build a prototype. I have an application that has a thousand users. Now I want to start yeah. using either Copilot or ChatGPT to help me. Is that something that is you're seeing uh, companies starting to ask themselves? Um, what I see sometimes is thought of how to make this uh, scalable. And it's like there's a lot of existing out of the box solutions out there, right? You can uh, use all sorts of, if we break it down to different parts of DevOps, right? We talked in the beginning how the opening slide was uh, devops.com. So it always circles back to whatever the app is you build, how are you going to serve it? Um, you, you can use AI, I think, in all the different stages of your DevOps lifecycle. Like it can review PRs for you. It can make small patches for you if you need, um, if you need, like make one small change. This can be sometimes automated to the level that one makes it and one like automatically make it, automatic review it, put some even AI into your CI, CD, different steps of that pipeline. Scaling is not much of a problem. You know, many use cloud, so just give it more servers. Um, a big actually technical problems that I see, uh, the biggest right now, I, I may say from what I get in conversations, let's say with companies, is that a GPT-4 API is not fast enough. Like a very concrete fast, uh, very concrete problem. People say, yes, this is what I want to use. This is not something that is uh, it's uh, like speed at scale for me because the responses of GPT-4 many times are better than GPT-3.5 for specific things. It's not fast enough, especially if I have all those people. So one concrete solution for this one concrete problem would be uh, fine tuning 3.5 on that very small set uh, that is relevant for you and then using that. 3.5 is a lot cheaper, a lot faster. So uh, uh, this is solving that problem for you. And generally this, I, I see this kind of as the beginning of a trend of like focused little LLMs not saying that 3.5 is smaller, it's smaller in comparison to four, but you can also mm -hmm. have even smaller ones, like take your Lama, whatever, um, make it specific to that thing and then use that. So this is kind of one real problem I see uh, in scaling and real solutions that I actually see in practice in multiple places. I feel like, I feel like we're there, there's sort of two parallel tracks happening. Um, some of us are, taking LLMs and, you know, pineapple vector databases, et cetera, and kind of figuring out how generative AI works, right? Um, and you, you see that, you know, company websites even have like their CTOs tried this out and here it is. It may not be anything to do with what they do. And then the other track is, well, I'm not going to go do all, I'm not, and I'm working on understanding or building something in generative AI. I'm trying to understand how this can help us uh, and how far I can take it. Because the number of, folks in the chat or have said uh, we can't use it in our organization. It's It's been banned. It's not allowed, at least at this time. And I think that's sort of the until things settle down, we don't know what this means. So let's not sort of paint ourselves into a bad place and find out later this was a bad decision. Do, do you find, I mean, is that is that 10% of the people, organizations in the world that kind of shut off the gate temporarily? Or is that more, you see that more, frequent than that. I'm curious for the open AI. Well, for everybody. Jump right in. Yeah, I, I think I think that there's a few points there, right? So organizationally speaking, when an organization is trying to validate the use case of a technology that they're adding to their stack, they have to look at it in terms of a cost benefit, right? So they have to basically decide like, okay, hey, how, what is the, the major kind of negative that we get from this and the potential positive kind of externalities that get caught, uh, brought in. I think in general development teams, and I don't know if I've felt this as of late, but a lot of people are more interested in kind of, uh, how do I put this <laughs> nicely? Like kind of like pointing the finger at somebody else and being like, well, they added this to the stack. It wasn't me who added this to the stack. And AI makes it really hard to uh, assign blame correctly, <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, within a team and broadly speaking with, within a product. I think it depends. 
pins because I don't I don't really see a future where the velocity of people who are at organizations who don't use AI could ever be faster than organizations who use AI. It's literally not possible. <laughs> and I don't even mean for the, the product that they're making. I mean, all of the potential products that they could be making. Right. So we were talking a lot about like the, the decrease of cost of prototyping new ideas within an organization. At one point, Gmail was a prototype. Right. So something that we see is as as kind of production quality for our day uh, and the current representation of the technology has to really be kind of like put into the framework of like, OK, what are we actually trying to do here? Like what what is the thing that we're trying to sell people? What is the, the, the cost that that uh, occur to our company? To Jaime's question a second ago when he was talking about code that's running in production, I think it's really important that, you know, you can expand your test coverage like crazy with GPT. You can basically just hand it functions and say, write 30 different tests about this thing, right? And like you can, then it, that just saves developers a bunch of time to test the same function without adding anything to their production code stuff like in, uh, for example. So I, I think it's just important to kind of like put it into that frame of reference. Really think about what the organization's goals are and then kind of consider, okay, what are we actually trying to not do? And what can we consider doing if we if we leverage this type of technology and the companies that have been most open to that conversation, I think, have been able to kind of really evolve with this technology. Anyone else jump in? Yeah, I think to, to your point, Brahm, I jokingly said in chat, you know, now we can blame AI for breaking the build, right? That was always the Friday build. Don't break the build before we were doing CICD. Um, it seems like the, the we're in this experimentation phase, right? You're, you're not going to go generate code or modify code for the kind of the, the the gold jewel, golden jewels of your application that do the airline reservation algorithm or whatever your business is. You're not going to set it a foot on that, right? You mentioned use, use cases um, like generate test cases for me, explain this code, or you know, maybe try and refine this, simplify this code and see what it creates. And if that's something better than what I have now while I'm, because I'm doing refactoring, right? I have my way, but let's see if this, I pick up some ideas. Um, or maybe I do want it to create something for me and then I'll refactor that to the way I, my way I think about it. And, and I know we'll be comfortable using it. And there are organizations that are going to say, not quite yet, not quite yet. I think one of the big reasons is just code quality and making sure there's a human in the loop who is looked at, worked with, validated before it goes anywhere else, not just copy and paste it and now it's in their repo and part of the build and we go, uh-oh. I mean, that's my view on it. I, I'm sure, uh, Jean, th that you have a perspective on that because I know code quality is, a, is an important thing for, to you. Um, it is. I touched on this earlier, but I think I think um, it's my, my belief... <laughs> You know, I, I played around just doing an experimentation on my own with um, generating 10 um, pieces of code or 10 Python functions for the same prompt, which kind of I was kind of leading uh, or kind of baiting into in, uh, ChatGPT to tell me that it was going to use uh, a, pre a legacy library. But what I got really was, first of all, a wonderful experience because I, it was, I even used ChatGPT to generate the script that generated code, which is wonderful. We're living in the future, but it's really an idea of, of there's a lot of responsibility here for a human, right? We can't, it, the magic leads you to think that you can fully outsource the intelligence, but you can't, you have a lot of responsibility in making sure that you review the code and that you pro, you put a lot of design and, 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 and time into giving it a good prompt as well. So it's, if you don't put intention and thought into how you use AI, I think it, implicit design decision will be made for you and that's not good. So it, it's very important and, and, and there's responsibility in that. I think also, I think I am a vendor of code quality analysis, but I think it's really important because of things like training cutoffs inevitably will suggest uh, libraries that are not yet, that for example, are deprecated and that should not be used. And so from that perspective, I think it's really important also to make sure that in order to scale this out and to have more companies use this, and we're seeing even right now in our public, in, in, in the questions that people are asking, like, how do I get the company to adopt this? 
And I think it's by looking at how do we make make sure that we cover our bases is how we get it even largely adopted in companies. And so even from a code correctness perspective, papers have, have been mentioning that ChatGPT being the best of models with GPT-4 has 65% of code correctness. So that puts even more emphasis in us reading, comprehending, reviewing code, using static code analysis, using all these tools that are part of our arsenal for the last uh, few years. We, this is even more important now. That's my, my two cents, and I'll shut up now. Where, where did that number come from? You said, what, 65 code correctness coming out of GPT-4? It's, uh, it's a paper that was released in a paper called Evaluating Code Quality of AI-Assisted Code Generation Tools, so empirical <laughs> study with co-pilots and other other uh, other tools so it's it's Fantastic. people are are just applying a lot of testing to this because this is one of the most groundbreaking events in, in software development history mm -hmm. so uh quite exciting there really is any any to that, I want to add. yeah i'd love to hear what you say about that yeah so i have a little agenda here specifically on the programming languages and by now Bram can probably enchant that he heard it so much but uh, I think that Go specifically from all the programming languages out there is the most uh, future compatible in the context of AI and uh, it, it has many reasons to that one of them is what uh, Jaim just said that uh, it doesn't make up like invent imports or uses uh, like recommends to import things that don't exist which is at best breaking your code and it worsens actually severe security uh, incidents that, you know, it, it, let's say some very specific attack vector. I'm very interested in security in addition to uh, DevOps. So a little glimpse in there. Um, a specific attack vector on this field specifically that is quite well um, avoided with Go is that if you notice that in some specific snippet of code, it keeps generating the same type of library, which doesn't exist. Me as a hacker, I'll go and create that library and I'm going to put their malicious code that will hack or you know, mine crypto coins or whatnot. Um, and then what are you gonna do about that? So uh, yes, uh, it's, it's a real concern. And I think this will filter some of the languages going forward. Um, if you wanna hear the full <laughs> explanation that I have, you can search my name and look for Go um, AI development. You'll find a 45 minutes explanation to this point. And I will also uh, put in the chat a tool that I found that I really like. It's called PromptFu. And this is sort of a, they describe themselves, ensure high quality LLM outputs. Basically you say the test cases and it shows you kind of the test coverage in the context of what are outcomes that are possible for the prompts that you have for the LLMs that you use and so on. Sounds like that, there was a question typed in right, or right after you gave that URL that sort of fits exactly what that question is like, how do I, what's the prompt engineering, <laughs> right? To create these things, test cases. Um, and so there, think, there, there have been several uh, quite, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to hop on that point that Natalie made too about hallucinations within the latent space. I think it was really interesting about the latent space and having kind of like played with it over the past couple of years is that there are notable differences in the types of prompts that you feed these and the types of output that you get in the same way that you can kind of like point to a direction in the ocean and kind of like maybe go to that exact point by using a compass versus kind of like using a map. So I find that a lot of the time it's actually better to kind of understand how close you are to the problem that you're trying to solve and think about, well, how likely is it that this thing would exist between three other similar concepts? So it's not necessarily that you're just Googling it and looking for the exact answer. It's like, well, how likely is it that the model knows static analysis in addition to understanding this library in addition to the language of Go? And if you can answer all three of those questions, then you actually have a pretty high chance of the model, because the model is always hallucinating. That's always a point that I like to make people. It just hallucinates right most of the time. <laughs> so it's when it's hallucinating right or hallucinating wrong, it's hallucinating. Um, we're hallucinating. So <laughs> it looks right. Yeah, we're hallucinating technically. <laughs> I, I, I'm hallucinating every next word comes out of my mouth before I even know that it's here. You can see um, there's a video that just came out on YouTube recently of somebody using a, a, a sonic weapon where basically you aim it at the, the, the speaker's head. And because we hear our own voices and use that as a, as a way to talk, if it if it, the, vo the rate that you hear your own voice changes, your brain literally just can't form. Anyway, mm. my point being is that uh, that that 
if you if you are if you become well versed in latent space translation, you actually become better in prompt engineering as well, and you get to decrease the likelihood of running into the problems that that Jaime and Natalie brought up. Um, we haven't talked about the topic of security yet. You know, the safety, the secure, security of any code that we're using, either AI assisted or generated, for that matter. Um, it, it's it's a bigger topic, right? As developers, we're not always security experts, and at least in every aspect of security, you need to deploy deploy application safety. Is AI assisted potentially a way of improving security of what we're creating? I mean, couldn't we have LLMs that are specialized in, you know? Uh, helping you write code that isn't got built-in vulnerabilities or less liable to be hacked? Is that an area of specialization you think we'll see? I think LLM security is a big issue. Uh, it's a podcast I've been doing with a friend since May. That's very close to my heart personally. Uh, this is also a program that OpenAI has been putting a lot of uh, focus onto. Uh, they have two blog posts about that on the website. One, that they have a grant program for different uh, focus fields on defensive AI, uh, defensive security. Uh, I'll put both links later. And the second one is that they're uh, gearing up a red teaming right now. Uh, I'll put that link as well. And yeah, uh, there's lots of security issues around AI. I think the very first article I saw about that came already at GPT three times in the December 2020 that it was analyzing. Uh, for three languages, Python, Java, and C, I want to say, how many of the uh, completions that it made were secure versus not secure, it's like have uh, known violations and so on. And um, lots of ways of interpreting that. I, I take this back to the point that some languages are better <laughs> for this AI revolution because the code that they generate is just trained uh, on less bad practice code, right? Python has been a lot around long enough um, to have all sorts of code base lying around the internet that has uh, at best just bad practices, but also like straight ahead um, malicious code and whatnot, or just libraries that are bad. And some newer languages just have less of that. Uh, but yeah, very security is just going to the next level with AI. So more for the... Uh, defensive hackers and more for the offensive hackers. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add to, 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 to what Nelly just said. I think, you know, from, from, from conversations I've been having with customers, we estimate around 50% of the biggest worries or risks that, that our uh, customers are seeing is good quality and security. You know, it, it's the only thing above that is kind of the data privacy and protection. That's, that's how people are. Are, are perceiving these 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 risks, and so um, you know beyond the things that we already mentioned, um, I think having um, a clear idea that libraries need to be maintained, having other tools to check um, how we're producing code will be tremendously helpful. Um, and I am also a true believer that not only this is, I, I mean just the sheer amount of code that will be produced, I think that's just also be, you know, going to be a security risk because it's going to be more surface area for problems to be found. Um, I think also this will be a huge part of the solution as well. So I can't wait to see the future models, um, you know, models that are going to be trained just specifically to find issues and vulnerabilities ahead of time. Um, probably even monitoring stack logs and finding uh, issues in real time. So I think um, it's both a problem and a solution. And like with any maturity of any other piece of technology, it takes time. So it's, it's normal. I, I don't think it necessarily needs to affect adoption at scale for organizations um, as long as the processes and tools are there to protect a company, right? So um, that's what I would add. Jaime, I very much agree with you. Uh, there's more... There's also a lot more work done in specifically the last thing that you said, that tools to protect the company. Like I see in the office hours too, some companies that have recognized specific new challenges and are working on solving that. Um, and that's very interesting. There's also some companies, a little bit of a deviation, but still back to the office hours, uh, uh, some companies that uh, speak kind of legal tech, if that makes sense. They specifically try to solve the problem of IP and so on. And uh, this is, I know, not the focus here and not uh, 
something that is solved generally as a problem, but there are some tools that are working to find a way of, of um, correctly tracking back, if that makes sense, kind of the origins of some creation and seeing how can they reward the um, creator of that. So there's a one, I've been mentoring recently at some accelerator that's specific to AI startups. And one of the products there was a company that they, an artist can upload their style and then people can go and generate art that they like in that style with their personal touch and paying uh, royalties or some variation of, of payment for the uh, artist. Let, let's, let's kind of roll forward. I mean, our crystal balls or, you know, magic eight balls, whatever it is, you know, th there's no wrong answer because, because the future is not here yet. Um, but let, let's say we, we cross whatever this tipping point is from experimentation. Don't trust it fully yet. You know, we're, we're finding out what it, what AI assisted and AI generated code is best at and usable. The technology improves, but we, we sort of cross over that, that fulcrum. Um, what is, what does our software development life cycle look like when we're, we are at a place where this is just a, this is a companion tool, right? This is something we do use every day. Um, so shake up the globe, you know, kind of see where the snowflakes land. Anybody want to jump on that one first? Again, you can't be wrong because future's not here yet. We don't know. I think it'll probably be something akin to kind of a re- a re kind of like mainstreamifying of scripts as opposed to mega apps. I think if we kind of like look at what computation has been over the past 80 years, we kind of started with computers being very limited to ballistics research in World War II. And then people started doing symbolic computing and moving it into a little like more um, trying it in a few more like kind of areas in terms of like dealing with kind of user locations and stuff like that. I know that one of the first companies that ever actually bought a computer, like private companies was actually a cupcake company in uh, London because they were trying to figure out how they could get cupcakes and bake baked goods to places without it going bad. Um, so that was one of the first companies in the world that used computers. I think that, you know, what we saw with like kind of web one and web two is that a lot of people were like, I don't know how to solve this problem. So I need an approximation and I want one at scale. And so we got like 15 companies that like built every kind of at scale common use case problem, which is kind of like all the social media companies. And this is how I built my website companies. And this is yada, yada, yada. But people have very specific problems to them. And I think that that you can kind of see that at like the kind of doctor lawyer level where people will go and say like, hey, I know that there's a set of laws that exist in my country, but I need you to like coerce them into my specific case right now. Um, so I think that with these kind of like AI assisted development tools, we're going to get a lot more people who aren't necessarily traditional developers uh, being able to map out their particular problem in a way that they can get a N equals one solution. And I think that that's going to be a lot more common. So we're going to see a lot more people running apps on their phone that no other people have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we already see that a little bit with like shortcuts for iOS, for example, where people are going to have their own app stack, as it were, uh, with all these AI tools. Um, and then that's, I think it's going to bubble up to companies and stuff too, and how they actually respond to the service level of how they can help consumers. Um, my two cents is that if we just think linearly, it, like incremental changes, um, I think we're going to see tons of efficiency and speed. You know, there's an expectation that will dev cycles will be faster, increase speed of development, uh, improve tooling. So I think over the next few months, years, tons of tools, there's an expectation also AI will be more and more embedded in the IDE. There's already efforts such as Cursor um, and even obviously the, the rest of, of the IDEs are integrating um, AI into it. Um, programming will become even ha more high level. Um, as, as we think in the future. And then, you know, there's, there's kind of, if we think non-linearly, it just becomes crazy. Even this week, we have a multi-model GPT-4 that is able to see and interpret and create landing pages, as Natalie just said. Um, it, even rumors, I don't know if, if we should even talk about this, that there's a phone maybe in the works <laughs> from OpenAI, which is absolutely exciting. 
my to my personal bet is that natural language will become the abstraction in code bases, not just in ChatGPT. So we're going to be like, like we have Python today that abstracts all these all the stack until we have ones and zeros. I think we're going to have another one. We're going to be natural language in there in our code bases. Um, so I think it's just this roller coaster of, of craziness. Okay, Natalie, you get a shot at it. Yeah, I agree with you. Abstraction is the keyword. And I think it's, for me, it's easy to do this extrapolation. If I look back 50, 60 more years ago, programming was, or maybe more in the 60s, let's say it was taking punch cards and writing one function over 10 punch cards. And since then, abstractions have helped us to write this faster and simpler. And this is also an answer that I find myself giving when people say, but AI will take our jobs as developers. Um, it will take this specific job, but it will create a lot more other jobs on that new abstraction level. Like if you speak to a person from the 60s and say that you can have um, a social media manager, he's like, what? <laughs> Explain everything and, and all the steps that came that brought us from here to there. And it's hard to even imagine what will be the future equivalent of social media manager, but all those abstractions will bring us there and will create a lot more. Yeah, if I, if I can chime in on this too, Natalie and, and, and team, you know, there is, you know, the, the current thinking like you were uh, referring to, Jaime, which is, this is our paradigm now. This is how this can help us do what, how we understand solving problems. You know, I look at Python and I say, I'm still doing way too much housekeeping. You know, this should all be, that should all be taken care of. You know, put it in a Jupyter no notebook or something. Just get it out of here so I can work on the important part. But the it's it's kind of analogous to me. It won't happen the same way. But you think about when cloud was first beginning to uh, catch you know, a lot of people thought, oh, it's just somebody else's computer. And then you understand the paradigm of what you could do in a cloud environment and what different things are possible. You think back to, um, you know, there was a time when we said robotic surgery, no way, not on me. And several iterations until now we can do, do surgeries no one had ever conceived of doing. And, and I kind of think that's what, what I'm most excited about are there are ways of solving problems and, and building applications, but I think there's new kinds of applications that I can't even foresee what it might be, right? I couldn't have imagined, you know, robotic surgery, and I can't imagine what those apps might be until they come here. And I think that's, that to me is what's really exciting. I mean, you're projecting several places ahead, but it seems like we'll go through that kind of an evolution um, with uh, AI and AI-assisted code and AI-generated code. So you are all are welcome to you know, claim heresy and say, I'm a scientific sci-fi nut. That's crazy, Mitch. That'll never happen. Or, you know, I'd really be interested in your thoughts about this. Nobody's going um, to yeah, take I, me on, on in front of people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I, 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 think, I think adding your point into kind of also Natalie's, one of the things that, that for me has been quite exciting as well is, 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 how do we think about the future also of the profession of development? Like, mm -hmm. how do we think about the role of a developer? And as I mentioned before, I think, I think the world is so permeable to more software that I don't, I, I think more, we're going to have even more developers because of AI. That's my two mm -hmm. cents. Maybe doing different things, but like, we're all not coding, you know, all respect for Fortran or for trying anymore with coding in other programming languages. And I, one of the things that I've been seeing, honestly, is the last two years is the sentiment of developers. So I actually took 10 random, not fully random, so it's not a statistic analysis. I took 10 random posts about Copilot from Hacker News, which tends to be sometimes a difficult place for comments, so it's not the, the kindest of places. <laughs> but I took and I did sentiment analysis on them, and it seems over time that actually there's a positive sentiment over time being built. There's more confidence being built in tools like Copilot and ChatGPT, uh, as well as the negative sentiment being decreased over time. So I think that's also important as we think about um, the future of our profession as, as software developers. Um, and for me, that's also kind of exciting. Yeah, we couldn't have imagined we'd be here.
five years ago, right? Whatever time frame. Look at look at where we are. Um, I want to take just a little bit of a detour. I know that um, Codice is hosting um, a, a Codice Pioneers event. You want to say a little bit about that? We've got a link to that in the uh, handouts. I'm just saying, having come off of an AI hackathon that we hosted ourselves, these kind of things are a blast. And so hopefully uh, folks will check it out. But tell us a little bit more about it. Sure thing. So, so you know, when we started the company, we we um, we truly stood on the shoulder of giants in the open source community that helped us to start building prototypes, to analog code, even to fine tune our, our code analysis ourselves, but then to start servicing also the open source. So, open source has been at the core, at the heart of what we do and who we are as a company, um, and even more so is what we believe will continue to be important going forward into the future. And so internally, we created an initiative that um, sponsors great software projects that are open source. And we do that not only through um, some cash, uh, obviously that, that can be helpful for, 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 for creators to focus on their creations, but also through great mentorship. So we have people that have, you know, are at the forefront of software development that have been absolutely impactful, such as one of the co-founders of Prisma, the creator of UJS. We have people that are absolutely uh, impactful in their own communities as well um, from, from, from different uh, countries and, and geographies. So we're, we, we're really proud and we, we have a record breaking uh, number of applications. So for us, Codice Pioneers is, uh, again, the continuation of the labor of love is us giving back and we want to sponsor and help people create beautiful software, not just AI related, just po net positive to the world and, and community. So that's, that's what Codice Pioneers is all about. We haven't yet finished the deadline for application. So if you have an application, you have an open source project, please, please apply. We're reviewing them. We have, uh, we're humbled by adoption so far. So that's, that's what this is all about. Thank you for asking. Yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll put the, the URL in in, uh, in our chat. It's just codice.com slash pioneers. So thanks for making that simple, easy. Um, you know, this has been one of those events where the, the participants chat is by far overwhelming for us to be able to keep up and answer every question that's come up. So I apologize to folks that we haven't gotten to all of your questions. And I've tried to kind of lump a few topics together to hopefully answer some of those. Um, uh, Bram and, and Natalie, there's a lot of questions about how do I get started? What should I be using to kind of kick off my learning? I, I see that repeatedly in the chat and, and imagine that you get those questions too in your ambassador kind of roles. Do you want to recommend some places to, to, to advance your learning and maybe gain the benefit of your experience of gone through that learning cycle? Depends a lot on what uh, what is your background, what is your level. Um, uh, as as in the ambassadors page, we each one write a little bit about my our background. I I get the more boring questions. I think Bram is the creative technologies get the really cool ones. So he will say <laughs> for the people who have this crazy vision and how they go about implementing it. Um, but for the Boring people like myself were like, I know how to code. I know how to do maybe backend. I don't have anything crazy. I just want to optimize this API that I'm using, something along those lines. I pasted the link to the OpenAI cookbook, which is a repo with many examples. That is a, um, the, the developer advocate, uh, Logan at OpenAI. He's uh, the bigger maintainer here. And there's lots of code contributions, really interesting examples, different languages. Uh, I think that's a very good starting point. Specifically for those who want to do uh, some prompt engineering 101, there's a great course by Andrew Ng and a developer from OpenAI, I forgot her name. I will paste that link as well. This is from the deep learning platform and this is free and open for everyone. So I would recommend those two sources. Both of them I'll put in the chat. I don't know if anybody who's watching the recording will have access to all those links. Do you put them also? Um, that's a good question for Cody. He'll know, he'll know the answer to that. He's the master magician on All that right. part of this. Good. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are great resources. In addition to that, I mean, this is going to sound a little trite or whatever, but I, as I mentioned 
a number of times through this conversation, I think really good prompt engineering is actually just a really good understanding of your problem. So if you really want to get good at GPT, I would really recommend that you just journal more. <laughs> it's just write more about what you're trying to accomplish, really understand what you're trying to solve for, and really understand how to break things down. And we've seen libraries like Chronology and Langchain uh, attempt to solve this problem where you can kind of like put prompts together. Um, but I think that the the overall kind of perspective is how close to your problem are you? How easily can you split it up into sub problems? Developers tend to be pretty good at this type of thing. So you shouldn't be too concerned about this. Um, and then turning it into a series of steps that you can uh, iterate on. So that's, that's what I'd recommend is just breaking up pen and paper and just kind of journaling about what you, what you want to do. I'm going to step in for a second to say the name of the other instructor in the course that I mentioned too, because she definitely deserves the credit for all her work. Her name is Isa Fulford. I'm just typing this into chat. We've been doing prompt engineering for a long time, since the first web search engine, right? We all know how to construct, you know, how to ask Google to get what we're looking for, right? Sometimes better than others. And generative AI, it isn't the same prompting. I mean, if you try to do Google-ish kind of prompts in, in uh, generative AI, probably not going to get the results you're looking for, but you learn right the right way to set up and ask the question so don't be don't be intimidated by prompt prompt engineering just kind of learning how something works and get the responses from it you want we're just about at the end of our time um so how about lightning round one minute uh passing thought before we turn it over to cody by the way when cody comes on it's always good because he's giving out money at the gift card so um why don't you start it out uh Jami? I'm sorry. It's completely fine. Um, look, I'm super happy to to be here with this amazing panel. Um, you know, when we when we kind of thought about the session, uh, our objective was really to have a great, frank conversation about um, AI and AI and coding and, and coding and, and particularly code quality. And so we're we're seeing uh, front and center the impact, the very positive impact that. Um, AI is having in developing software. We want companies to be aware of how to do that responsibly with all the risks aware, and we're helping people do that. And so um, we believe and we see that that static code analysis is a great, you know, rule-based static analysis is a great complement to any AI tooling that you end up adopting. It gets you safe, gets you, gets you there at the speed of AI. So that's, that's what we see. Um, we're thrilled to count with our customers and see uh, their their evolution, um, and yeah, we're 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 spectators and happy to be part of the journey. And and if OpenAI wants to help, or 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 can 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 even help us improve good quality, would love to even talk more. So, thanks everyone for having us. Great, Natalie, Bram, anything you want to add? Last thought. It's a fun ride. Um, enjoy it this entire AI thing. Excellent. Cody. Uh, I would say Dan, that. I'm sorry. Code, I did, oh, right. didn't know you were going to go. Oh, no, it's fine. I don't, I don't get to turn this school. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say most code hasn't been written yet. And I think that that's something that, that is, a, is something that is important to realize is that code is still a very young thing. Uh, we've been coding for like 70 years, 80 years, if we want to call it punch cards or Fortran or wherever we wanted to start this conversation. So uh, just, know that we're really at the beginning of all of it. Since your cars loom, right? <laughs> Babbage. Okay. Um, take it away, Cody. Bring us some good stuff. I have come with gifts. Mitch, Natalie, Jime, and, and Bram, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this has been such a wonderful session, and the hour's absolute, absolutely flown by. Um, I've got got 20 links over here on the left side of my screen that I'll be digging into as soon as I jump off. And all of those links have also been uploaded to the handout section. So before you leave, feel free to grab those, get those pulled up in an extra window. You will not want to miss out on those. Um, so once again, Natalie, Bram, Jim, and Mitch, thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that we have recorded our session today. You will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand or you can find it living on the DevOps website. 
just visit devops.com slash webinars and be sure to look in the on-demand section. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing, they are Inez B, Polina P, Benjamin W, and Sumit E. So congratulations to our four winners. I'll be reaching out to you shortly to get these gift cards out to you. If you don't happen to see an email from me, check your spam folder just in case it happens to be filtered out. As far as the winners of our swag giveaway today, those, those winners are going to be selected at a later point in time. So uh, if you participated with us today, you might just be lucky enough to be contacted by Codacy um, at a later point in time with some free swag coming your way soon. Uh, uh, speaking of Codacy, I'd like to thank them for sponsoring our program today and assembling this wonderful panel. And to everyone else in the audience, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have posted a link to our post-webinar survey, but if you stick around until we close out, you will be funneled there. And we would love to hear your thoughts, whether they're about today's program or suggestions for future topics. Please let us know because we'd love to hear your feedback. Either way, we hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day and you may now disconnect. Thank you once again, everyone.